we've decided to do another episode where we tell stories about us drinking and doing stupid stuff. Turns out we have more material for that than anything else. This is Third Song In with Chris Derrickson and Tom Polachek. Luckily, most of these are from more than 10 years ago. It passed, hopefully past the statute of limitations. That's what we, <laughs> my only concern. <laughs> yes. Let's tell some stories about drinking stuff. I will, <laughs> let, let me start. I'm going to start. One of our good friends got married very soon after college and uh, he, we were all still living in St. Louis, even though the wedding itself was out on the East Coast. Uh, we threw a bachelor party for him uh, in St. Louis. Uh, we rented uh, a suite down on the landing, Laclede's Landing in St. Louis. We all got there. This was on a Saturday. We all got there probably about noon or one and started drinking, of course, immediately. And there's all kinds of bars and restaurants and I can't remember, but we made plans and we ate at a specific place. And then we went to a couple different bars. Uh, but there was no question that the end of that uh, bachelor party was going to be across the river uh, in Soge, Illinois, which is the famous home of PTs, uh, which is a strip club, which, as far as I know, is still up and running uh, in that area, but uh, was a, 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 a stalwart even back then, it had been around for decades, and it was always where people ended up after bachelor parties. So it was probably, I don't know, it was probably around midnight or so when we left the landing. We, we had a limo or, or a couple taxi cabs. All I know is none of us were driving, which was smart and probably unusual in the 80s to think ahead that far. But we had either a van or a limo or something, and we were so hammered. I can remember... At one point, and I think I always think of it as being you, um, but somebody was out on the main drag in, in the landing as we were waiting for the van, um, stopping traffic and asking for ID. And I swear it was you, but I'm not 100 percent sure because most of my memories are pretty foggy from that night. So we, we got yelled at by actual cops and doormen and people to stop stopping traffic in the, in the middle of a busy Saturday night in downtown St. Louis. We ended up at PT's and my friend's brother was more drunk than the rest of us, which was amazing because he also outweighed all of us by about 150 pounds. He was about six foot and he was he was built like, uh, you know, refrigerator Perry. He was giant, <laughs> but he also could really put down a beer and he must have been drinking even more than I realized because he was hammered. And the very first thing he does, we, we walk in, there's a main entrance to PT's. We walk in, you have to pay the cover, which is probably about 10 bucks or 20 bucks or something like that. And there's a big group of us and we're all paying. And my buddy's brother, and I'll say his name because I'm not sure anybody can make the connection. His name was Mark. He was one of the first to pay. I was right after him. And he walked in through the double doors into the main part of the bar and there's, you know, the normal stripper music playing and everything is going on. And I come in right behind him. And instead of walking toward the bar and the tables and where all the dancing you know, stages were, he hooks an immediate left and goes down a dark hallway that I had never even noticed before. And I didn't know what the hell he was doing. I was a little worried about him because he was so hammered. And I, I followed him. I lost him a little bit because he was kind of on a jog. And then I realized that he had turned right into a room. There was just a door. It wasn't marked that, that I saw, at least at that time. And he shut the door. And as I, I followed in behind him, I opened the door. I looked in. He had, it was an office. It was probably the manager's office. And as I opened the door, he was pulling open a desk drawer and took a leak right in the manager's, in the desk of the manager's office. And I, I was like... Mark, get the fuck out of What are you doing? What are you doing? He zips up, he walks out. He, I, and I like, I ran past him to get away from the thing because I was afraid we were going to get in trouble. I assumed that there were cameras. I assumed we were going to get uh, thrown out at any minute and it never happened. We were there for God only knows how long, you know, did what you do, with, you know, lost all our money at the, at the stages. But the very first thing Mark did when he walked in the door was go to the manager's office take a piss in the desk drawer, and then go back out. Two things. One, it always 
makes me so grateful that we did all this shit 30 years ago before everyone mm-hmm. had everyone had cameras on their phones in their offices everything because some of the stuff that would have got caught on camera would have been well it oh, would have yeah. gone viral but i'm not sure i would have wanted to go viral so. <laughs> right <laughs> right you certainly would have been caught you know i assume there was security cameras back then it wasn't that far in the dark ages but nothing that i'm aware ever came of it and and uh you're right i mean i'm not one to pull out my phone and take video but somebody probably would have uh would have got caught video of him doing that and that could have changed everything yeah and the second thing on that story I'm pretty sure you're right. I think it might have been me out there directing traffic or taking IDs. And that is funny because I don't tend to go, you know, piss in somebody's drawer. Um, (laughs) But if you hang out with me without drinks, I'm low key in the background. The second I have one too many drinks, I am out directing traffic. (laughs) I can I can just picture you kind of standing to the side of the street and there's a two-way street you know two lanes it's not a huge thoroughfare or anything like that but i but cars would pull up and you would be standing there kind of like you you know feet spread and shoulder width apart and you put out your left hand and go hold stop 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 and people you'd see them they pull up and quizzical expression on their face and roll down the window and you'd you'd, id please they're like what what are you talking about I, I need to see your ID. And most of them would just say, fuck you and drive away. And, you'd go, and I just remember somebody did that. And you kind of turned as they went by and you went, you may proceed. <laughs> I have my moments. We've referenced the Oklahoma story on at least one other time. Uh, you and I were driving to um, your mom's house in near Oklahoma, Ada, Ada, Correct. Oklahoma. We're going to go to the football game. I think the next day your brother was either in the state championship or in the playoffs. I forget which one it was. Yeah, championship for sure. Championship, yep. So then we go to one of the local bars in Oklahoma had 3-2 uh, beer laws, so really low alcohol beer. And they had a really strange law that you had to bring your own alcohol bar. You would give it to the bartender. Oh, yeah. And then um, you would basically pay for the mixers plus the alcohol. And then the Bass Ackwards law was you couldn't leave with the alcohol. So there's right. this subtle motivation to drink more of it so you don't waste your money. Right. right. So you bring your own bottle, right? That's yeah, you bring your own bottle. And then if you only drink two drinks, you leave it there. So you're like, well, hell, I brought my bottle. Let's have four or five drinks. So I think <laughs> you and I did that. And... uh We were feeling pretty good by the end of the night. Uh, I won't get into too many of the details, but you left uh, with somebody and said, you know, make your way home. Um, And I left with somebody. What a great host I was. (laughs) And uh, I went to this person's house. First time ever in Ada, Oklahoma. There's no GPS. (laughs) She's she kicks me out. She's like, you got to go home. And I'm like, how the hell do I get to Tom's mom's house? Like, I had no idea where I was going. There's and no I, cell phones. No cell phones. There's no, I mean, even if there's a map, it's like the middle of the night. I uh, start driving. And the next thing I remember is waking up on your mom's couch. I have no idea how I made oh. it there. You were there too. I have no idea how you made it. I assume the person you were with dropped you off. But those are the scary moments and Children do not repeat these efforts. Yeah. We it's did a good some thing. stupid ass stuff. It's a good thing our kids don't listen to this podcast. Yeah, it's a good thing nobody listens to this podcast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now that you said that, it's very true. That's a because, silver lining I never really considered. Yeah, th- these are not our proudest moments. And we're not uh, reveling in them. We're just telling them. Yeah, the only other uh, the only other one I'll bring up today, because God knows we'll have a part three of this or a part four of this somewhere down the line. Another drinking story that that didn't involve me directly, but I was there, is that when I was a senior in college, we sent our intramural basketball team to play in a big tournament at, in Kansas State at Kansas State, which is in uh, Manhattan, Kansas. So we drove from St. Louis, a big group of us, I think there were seven of us maybe, to play in this big uh, uh, Phi Delta Theta basketball tournament that they did annually. The tournament, I think, was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, something like that. And we played on Friday, I think we played one game, and then we went out into Manhattan uh, 
afterwards to get something to eat. And then, of course, we were going to, you know, we ended up drinking. And at the start of the night, two of the guys on the team made a bet uh, and, and proposed a contest to see who could go the longest without taking a leak. So my theme for the drinking episode, apparently, <laughs> this, this time is uh, drinking and pissing, or in this case, not <laughs> pissing. These two guys, we, we probably were out for four hours, and we drank at every bar we went to, and these guys didn't, they weren't hesitating to drink, at least not initially. They were drinking, and it was just pitchers of beer, but they were drinking as much as I was. They were drinking as much as anybody else was that was there, but they were not going to the bathroom. And we're about three and a half hours into this evening. So it's probably about 11 o'clock or something like that. And we're walking. Uh, we were either going to another bar or we had decided we'd had enough and we we're headed back to this, this uh, fraternity house. And I just remember walking across a, a more or less empty parking lot. And there were the seven or eight of us were there. And these guys were poking each other in the stomach and trying to tickle each other. And they were doing everything they could to make basically to make them piss their pants. <laughs> and they were both, both these guys were walking across the parking lot and they were bent over, like they were physically in pain for refusing to take a leak because they'd been drinking all night long. And finally one of them said, ah, I give up, you win. And he, right in the middle of the parking lot, he, you know, he unzips and he starts to take a leak. And as soon as he starts, the other guy goes, okay, and, and starts himself. Those two guys, I am not kidding you, they stood there and pissed for over five minutes it just <laughs> it just never ended and the rest of us were all like 10 feet away from we were laughing and pointing and joking at it it was absolutely hilarious and they when they were done it was like they had run a marathon they both looked horrible they were so exhausted from holding in all right so you went with the urine theme <laughs> yes <I'm> go <laughs> Some, somehow that's what i did i'm going with the mugging theme so twice i was out and was too drunk to realize that i was about to get mugged luckily i had people with me that took care of me so one time so i went to japan as a graduate student and the one guy i was with also won't say names was a former basketball player big guy i was not worried at all. i was like sort of hanging out with you at jimmy's but we were pretty drunk on sake um so the theme of the story the story the tour um, we went to Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and we met with the survivors of the nuclear attack. Um, and one of the survivors, a woman, who was one of the funnest people I've ever hung out with, and she got us all drunk on sake. After doing that, we went out on the town and we're looking for more things to do. Well, there was nothing else to do. And luckily, we had a couple of our Japanese escorts, not escorts, uh, other students with us, and uh, they knew what was going on. But there was this group that kept following us. And we kept looking at them, wondering what they were up to. And then finally, one of the students went over to them and they came back and they said, they want to rob us. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said well, I don't know what we said, but I don't want to be robbed. <laughs> and uh, uh, sorry, the guy that uh, I was with, the basketball player, started moving in their direction. And uh, that sort of ended the uh, the attempted robbery. So it's funny because it, it, there was nothing violent about it. And these guys weren't like, street guys these were like guys, they look just like us and they were a lot smaller than us even me so and i don't think other countries have weapons like the united states does so it wasn't even that like they didn't flash anything at us but it's just funny the guy came back he's like they want to rob us <laughs> that's uh that's but, very polite i will yeah. say i've always heard <laughs> all right one more and it's somewhat similar but i have a slight twist on it so i went to when i was at american university still I ended up being a director of admissions for an international studies program. And one of the things we did is go to these uh, recruiting fairs all over the country. Um, but we were in Tennessee. There was one night in Nashville and the second night was in Memphis. And at the Memphis one, the guy at the table next to me had been at the one at Nashville and neither of us were getting any business for whatever reason. These just weren't really good uh, fairs. So we just started talking, hanging out, and we agreed to go out later that night. He was an African-American guy who worked, I think, at the law school at NYU. At the time, shows how old I am, he had sort of a coolio look purposefully, um, his hair and everything. And so we're out in the town that night in Memphis getting pretty lit up. And then sort of two, three things happen. All through the night, you get a bunch of these drunk white 
kids yelling at him, hey, Coolio, you know, just making fun of him. And by the end of the night, I'm like yelling back, you know, fuck you or whatever. <laughs> a little bit later, we go to this place where it's serve yourself like mixed drinks, like the the slushies. I guess maybe it wasn't serve yourself. They were all pre-made. Gotcha. So you don't you get a slushy and they would uh we're sitting in the middle of it and he says to me, he goes, Hey man, you notice anything? And I'm like, Yeah, I notice I need a drink. And he's like, No, 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 look around you. And I look around and I'm the only white guy in a place just packed to I mean just body to body, just packed. <laughs> he was so impressed that I was so comfortable. And I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and I was like, let's go get a drink. <laughs> so I want to just copy. This isn't drunkenness so much, but as we're walking around and a bunch of drunk white people can't resist yelling Coolio at this guy. Yeah. I'm in a bar packed with black people who don't even bother me, acknowledge me. It's just right. what it is. And so that was one of the cooler moments, however. Later that night, we are walking back. Uh, we were in the same hotel, and a guy is following us. And this guy looks like someone who could mug us. And my my buddy, my new buddy from New York, is like, "Hold on a second, let me go take care of this." And he walks over. He's talking to the guy for a while, and he comes back. He's like, "All right, we're good." I was like, "What did you say to him?" He's like, "I told him I'd come back tomorrow night and give him twenty bucks." I'm like, "Oh, and that worked." He's like, "Yeah." He's like, "You just have to know how to deal with these guys." So we walked back, and that was it. So twice, oh, I almost shit. got, and I was. Uh, you know, these aren't funny drunk stories, but it's that same thing, doing stupid stuff. If I'd been walking back by myself, I probably would have been mugged. I have never heard of diffusing a situation like that by saying, I'll be, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Like, I want to know, did he go back? <laughs> yeah, I, I want to know. I didn't know. I didn't see him the next day because uh, we, I headed out. Uh, he said he was staying, but we'll, who knows? Or maybe that's, he said he'd bring me back the next night. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and offer me up. <laughs> that's right. Sacrifice. I, that seems you know, that seems fair. I don't know. It, it, does. it does. <laughs> All right. Yes. I do have a, call, or a question this week from Jonathan in Waterproof, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jonathan's question is, what is your favorite day drinking story? And I have one to start us off with. Uh And I I don't remember. I know we hung out later that night, but I don't remember. I think it was just three of us. So we lived in the dorms. It's freshman year. After that, we lived in the fraternity house. Um, My roommate uh, only lasted a year or two at at, uh, WashU. And another of the guys, I'll leave him as anonymous, uh, was one of our buddies who we still stay in touch with. So we decided we'd host a party at our dorm with a keg. And the thing about WashU is it's pretty much whatever happens behind your doors is fine as long as it doesn't impose on the other residents or isn't incredibly illegal. Um, So having a keg at whatever, 18 or 19 was not considered too bad. So we had some folks over, uh, we woke up the next morning, we had barely put a dent in that keg. I mean, it's amazing how much beer is in beer kegs. And <laughs> so we called up our other buddy to come over and it was like 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. We got up early for whatever reason. We started drinking and we started playing drinking games with the goal of killing the rest of that keg. So we did not kill the keg. Um, and I don't even remember, we never left the room. I, we didn't even do anything overly funny, but it had one of my most lasting memories from college. We were playing darts and depending on, I think if you got a bullseye, whatever the rules were, you got to name a rule. And one of the rules that got named was you couldn't say a number. So we're playing darts, so you can't say the numbers that you throw. So we're all struggling with that. And then a couple or two minutes later, off the stereo, um, Leonard Skinner's Give Me Three Steps starts blaring. And we're all singing it. And we're all going, give me steps, give me <laughs> this, give me this. So we're all like, and we're all like dancing. Like it's in unison. Like the three of us are drunk and shouting. <laughs> I'm sure the, I'm sure our choreographing was fantastic. <laughs> um, but that was just funny as hell because it was the perfect timing. And I know, I think we did a road trip that night. Um, so we went straight to drinking some more. And I, I'm pretty sure you were on the road trip. I don't remember which one it was, but 
it, we drank so much alcohol that day. I mean, I went, I probably got drunk twice in one day, um, <laughs> but I got drunk fast enough the second time that I didn't have my hangover. I can only imagine that I had a horrible hangover the next day, but that never stopped us. It's like now if I get a hangover, up, I'm not drinking for a fucking month. Like I'm right. done. <laughs> right. I can't even, I can't even think about beer at that point. I know. I'm like, beer is like the worst possible thought. Back then, it's like, hair the dog, baby. Give me a beer. So in response to Jonathan's question, uh, the event that occurs to me as far as day drinking is concerned, and day drinking, by the way, is a term that I wasn't really familiar with until really probably only a few years back. I, I'm not sure when that became a, a phrase that people used. Uh, we did it, obviously, but really not that often. When I look back, at, you know, even in college, with few exceptions, we didn't start drinking. I mean, you know, you just told a story about starting at 730 in the morning. So occasionally it, it happened. Uh, but I didn't often do that. I wouldn't start you know, drinking even on the weekends. I usually wouldn't start drinking until at least like three or four o'clock, let alone you know, earlier than that. But now day drinking starting at noon seems to be a thing people do. And I once ended up day drinking uh, completely unplanned. And this is, you know, much, much after undergraduates, much, much after law school. In fact, I was a partner in a law firm that kind of blew up. And you could see it coming for a few weeks before it actually happened. And without getting into sort of details, there was a meeting of the partners. And at that time, I think there were about 12 of us and at the end of that meeting, it was very clear that we were no longer going to be a firm and there were going to be two separate firms that, are, that rose from the ashes. And it was all, it was tense, but it wasn't horrible. And I've, you know, since then heard all kinds of stories about how firms go up, blow up, and there's litigation and, you know, hurt feelings and a lot of anger. Ours didn't really work that way, thank goodness. But at, on that particular day, it was a very strange feeling. And the, the way the, the, the chips fell, the way the, the firm divided up, basically half of the firm went one way and half of the firm was going to go the other way. And it was more or less divided by age. Uh, the older guys were going to stay together. The younger guys were going to create their own firm, et cetera. So we, we and I, at that point, I was one of the younger guys. <laughs> We went to lunch after this very long partners meeting that, that kind of was the conclusion of the old firm. And we just went to one of the local joints that we usually go to to get sandwiches. And we, you know, we had a couple beers and there were, I want to say, five of us there. We realized that we had no desire to go back to the office and work. And we still had clients. We still had work. There were things that needed to be done. And we all agreed we were going to do this as smoothly as we possibly could. But on that particular day at lunch, after probably two or three beers into a, a long lunch, we decided, yeah, not going back to the office today. And I wish I could take credit for it, but the best idea of the day was to go bowling. <laughs> so at about one o'clock in the afternoon, we left the, the restaurant we were at. We went to a local bowling alley and probably drank, I don't know, six pitchers of beer amongst us. We ended up calling up spouses and other people who showed up around three or four, and we bowled for the entire day and drank the whole time. And uh, it, frankly, it kind of took a little of the sting out of what had just happened because I was one of the people that was kind of upset about how it all worked out. But uh, that's the I, I want to say that might be the might be the most recent incident of uh, day drinking for me, but it certainly was the most impromptu situation I ever came across where. I went to work that day in a suit and tie, expecting to you know get my normal eight to ten hours in, and uh, by noon that was through. We were, uh, but about two hours later, we were all you know ties and coats thrown over chairs, and we were uh, bowling horribly for the next three or four hours. Let's move to our recommendations. Each episode, we like to provide recommendations from then. Uh, and when I say recommendations, I mean pop culture recommendations, music, books, movies, whatever it may be. Um, our recommendations from then, uh, we define as recommendations of pop culture before 2000. Uh, we'll then give you some recommendations. Uh, each of us will give one for the year 2000 or sooner. And I will give our my first recommendation. And this is uh, an album 
uh, that came out in 1995 by an artist, uh, what I guess we would call an Americana artist now, uh, named Wayne Hancock, and the album is Thunderstorms and Neon Signs. It is, if not his first, uh, it's the first album I think that got him any acclaim. Uh, he is really a throwback type of singer. He sounds very much like classic Hank Williams to me. He loves to sing songs about honky tonks and bars and drinking on the road, that kind of thing. And Thunderstorms and Neon Signs is also a song on the album, fantastic song. The whole album is kind of revolves around that culture, the honky tonk culture, and, you know, the music and drinking and what have you. And um, I, uh, I recommend it highly. I hadn't listened to it for a while when I was trying to think about recommendations for today's episode and I re-listened to it and I'm giving it a four out of five rating, four out of five egg burritos or sour cream. Uh, it's well worth the listen. And uh, that is my then recommendation. He was so throwback that he was almost punk because he was, I mean, he's very, very, very traditional. I'm not saying he was punk, but I remember he was really outside of the norm at that time and yeah. sort of brought back that, if there's no other way to describe it, that sort of honky tonk Hank Williams feel. And he was also pretty hard. Like he was, some of his stuff was pretty fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. He had a great band behind him, still does. And he's still performing. I think he just came out with a new album within the last two years. So he's still out there. I know he's still touring. It, it, he's a bit of an acquired taste, I think, because of that, because it, it sounds almost old timey. Yeah. Uh, until you listen to the lyrics and, and the, you realize that the musicianship is. You know, it's it's more produced than kind of a stripped down acoustic type of, of uh, music. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is um, both of us have picked Americana type of bands. The reason I say it's interesting is you have a blog up this week that talks about how so many of the bands that tried to copy Uncle Tupelo um, sort of faded into nothingness other than bands like Lucero. Um, but there's a whole bunch of different Americana subgenres. Um, so you got the neo-traditional, which is, I think, what Wayne Hancock would have been. Yep. And then I chose for my then recommendation a song from the Hangdogs 1997 album, East of Yesterday. Um, they had two albums in a row, East of Yesterday, and I'm going to blank on the other one, but it was after 2000, so I couldn't use it. I think a horribly underappreciated band uh, they were from Iowa, I believe, uh, but they made their living in New York, um, which is an interesting place to try to establish yourself as a country rock band. And I, I would emphasize more of the rock. And what I think is so great about uh, Hangdogs, their lead singer and primary writer's name is Matthew Grimm. He's a great songwriter. He's a storyteller. He has some of the catchiest songs. I think I've talked about it before. He has a song called Fuck, 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 which is easily the catchiest song you will listen to like i dare you to listen to it and not be singing it for the rest of the day and there's no way that that's ever going to be on the radio if there you know, there's no radio anymore but songs like that um his, he's able to write really catchy songs they just never caught on unfortunately uh, but the song i chose is uh called speed rack um and it's just basically using and folks if you don't know what it is the speed rack is that a rack below where a bartender makes drinks so the really good alcohol is on the wall behind you so people can see it so if you want like mm. a, a vodka you know you're gonna see uh, absolute or stolies or something else on the wall behind you if you just want a vodka and tonic you're gonna get some rot gut vodka off the speed rack and that's basically what the song is about is this person is living their life um, a little too hard, he calls it living the rot gut of life. And that's what the speed rack is. So it's using the speed rack as a metaphor for this person's life. Uh, again, a very, very catchy song. Um, they're a band that I keep coming back to. Matthew Grimm broke off and did solo work. Uh, some of his newer stuff uh, is very, very political, um, but he can still write as catchy a song as anyone. So I did really encourage folks to check out some of the hang dogs earlier albums especially there this is the first one i think i like, sort of like with wayne hancock i think they had an mm. ep before this and then this was their first real album east of yesterday 
Yeah, that's I I do like early Hang Dogs a lot. The other album was uh, Beware of Dog. Yes, uh, which Thank also you. has that's the one. Meet Me at Tommy's. There's another great bar song, yes. right? Uh, they did a lot of singing about drinking, and you know, I guess it's kind of the Wayne Han- Hancock thing, even though a different style of music, uh, for sure. But you know, it's funny, you know, how many of these bands tend to sing about being on the road and being in bars and drinking. And, you know, I guess you you write what you know, right? My guess is that a lot of it comes from experience. Do you want me to do uh, recommendations for now? Sure. What do you got? Right. This is not in any way a funny one. Uh, and I've only seen this movie once, but I remember being enthralled by it. One of those movies where you watch and you're, cheering for the protagonist and they just keep doing stuff uh to fuck things up uh, but it's <laughs> the girl on the train uh from 2016 it's it's directed by tate taylor and i put to just starring emily blunt because i thought that she was the i mean she was the whole movie to me it's a story about a a woman who is in a fairly unhappy life she is drunk a lot and she's riding to work one morning on the train and she always sits on the same side and she sees this one house and she swears she sees a woman being killed and the rest of the movie is going through um, her trying to piece this all together being dismissed as a drunk um, and in the end I guess it's a eight-year-old movies i'm not giving too much away um and turns out that um a lot of the times that her husband is uh certainly not helping her situation i don't remember if he was i don't think he was drugging her or anything but he was he was playing up her drunkenness to people Uh, there's one incident i think it's lisa Lisa kudrow from friends um, where it said that she like was breaking stuff at the party she was so drunk and in fact it couldn't have been she went off and fell asleep and her husband told her all this stuff just to sort of control her with how how bad of a drunk she was and then she finally pulls it all together and in the end they end up killing uh the husband two women who both been uh sort of abused in their own way by him and they team up together and claim it was self-defense so Really great acting, acting by Emily Blunt. It's tough to watch sometimes because of she certainly does drink quite a bit in the in the movie, um, but her acting is fantastic. So if I butchered that theme, that you know, I only saw it once, but it's a good movie. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> I might I'm have been sur- drunk when I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm uh, I'm surprised I haven't seen that movie mainly because I'm in love with Emily Blunt and will watch anything yeah. she's in. And I do remember it coming out. It, 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 at least the advertising and even your description, it sounds like it's kind of that thriller, yeah. uh, you know, bad husband type of movie, I'm, which I'm not a big fan of the, the genre right. or the sub genre, I guess. Um, but usually my my love for Emily Blunt will outweigh that kind of thinking. But I have not seen it. If I recall, like, I don't remember saying, hey, let's go watch the girl on the train. I think it just happened to be playing. Mm-hmm. So I may have even missed the first part of it, like, but not much. And it just enthralled me. And it, it was her. Like she is. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's a really, really great actress. So what do you she's, got this for your recommendation? So my recommendation for now is, oh, wait. Um, oh, in fuck. fact, yes, you forgot <laughs> again, you son of a bitch. Uh, it's easy. Even... I get four out of five stars. Four, four out of five stars. Four out of five egg burritos and sour cream for speed rack. Um, I think he, they have better stuff later but it's a really good song uh and then four out of five for girl on the train uh i only enjoyed it because of her i agree with you tom that that subgenre of thrillers is a little bit overwrought so but uh, yeah. it's well worth watching her so my recommendation for now is from 2013 it's also a film it's one of uh, a trilogy or a very loosely defined trilogy but the, it's a movie directed by edgar wright who is one of my favorite directors i there is rarely a movie that he puts out that I don't just greatly enjoy. This one is called The World's End. It's uh, it's part of the Cornetto trilogy, which is, uh, as I said, kind of loosely defined. All three of the movies in the trilogy star Simon Pegg and Nick Frost in various roles. They're not, they don't play the same characters. They're not connected as 
you know, narratively, it's just uh, those actors and, and apparently the random appearance uh, Cornetto package in each of the films, Cornetto being, I guess, a British like treat of some sort, like candy or a cookie or something. Uh, but The World's End, uh, the reason I recommended it is because it focuses on Simon Pegg's character who goes back to his hometown uh, and meets his old high school buddies. And his purpose in returning is that he wants to finish this pub crawl that they never finished where they're going to go to, I want to say it's five, it might be six different bars and finish a pint at each one, uh, which they started to do when they were in high school and for some reason didn't finish. And it, it's a really interesting look at, it's one of those reunion movies where everybody has moved on, you know, except for Simon Pegg's character. Uh, but what's weird about it and the twist, because Edgar Wright always has something interesting in his films, and it turns into an alien invasion movie about halfway through. <laughs> you realize that there are weird, crazy alien robots involved, and they have to band together to defeat the uh, the alien invaders. Edgar Wright is, is really, really funny. Simon Pegg is really, really funny. Nick Frost is probably funnier than both of them put together. Uh, when you get uh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost and the, the screen together, I can't think of a movie that I haven't just enjoyed uh, completely when those two are together. The first movie in this trilogy was called um, Shaun of the Dead, and that's kind of the movie that was the breakout movie for Edgar Wright. This one, because of the, the pub crawl aspect of it, I thought would be a good recommendation. Really, what I'm telling you is watch everything by Edgar Wright. This is probably my, one of my least favorite of the movies, but it still made me laugh uh, tremendously. I'm going to give it a three out of five. Egg Brios with sour cream. And that's really just to urge you to look at the movies that I would probably give five out of five um, by Edgar Wright, including um, Shaun of the Dead, which is fantastic. And also, I guess, revolved around a pub. So I suppose I could have used that. But this way, I get to talk about both movies. I've seen the first two of those trilogies. I've not seen the third one, but I was going to use it in the previous the previous time we discussed this topic, but I didn't want to use a movie I hadn't seen at all. So I just, I like to use movies that I've barely seen so I can get <laughs> some of the details right. Yeah, I should probably give you the list. Of the, so the, the three movies in the trilogy uh, were uh, Shaun of the Dead, which yep. came out in 04, uh, Hot Fuzz, which came out in 07, which is kind of an action cop movie, except that it also has this weird twist where they uh, they have to battle this secret society in this tiny little town in the you know countryside outside of London, uh, and then um, the World's End, which was uh, which came out in 2013. He's also directed uh, Baby Driver, which is one of my all-time favorite movies. Uh, most recently, I think was Last Night in Soho uh, in 2021, which was not as good, I think, as some of the other ones, but still just interesting to watch. He's just got an interesting way of, of uh, looking at things. Let's talk a little post facto. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. Post facto is where we discuss either errors we've made. Uh, or things we failed to remember in earlier episodes or things that were pointed out to us by listeners. Uh, it's just our opportunity to kind of fill in the gaps from, from prior episodes of the podcast. So one of the things that I wanted to bring up uh, with and actually would, am inviting commentary on is that I have finally switched to new editing software. You guys have been hearing me whining about it for months now. Uh, and I had a couple false starts with a couple different uh, uh, software platforms. And this, I think last episode was the very first episode that we presented that was edited completely using a software called Reaper. And uh, I'd like some feedback. I'd like to know what you think about it, whether it sounds smooth, whether it uh, is doing the job. I think it technically it was two episodes ago. By the time people hear this one, uh, oh, yeah. we'll have laid another one down so that the previous two episodes will have been edited um, in, in the new software. Yeah, I think you're right. It's uh, I'm just not used to being ahead. <laughs> I know we're always like, struggling. It's like, shit, we got to put one out tomorrow. Let's, let's record right now. <laughs> exactly. But we are we ahead, get it. We're ahead of the game right now. We are. We'll see how long that lasts. 
Also, for post facto, I've gotten some feedback from listeners. Uh, one was just a longtime listener and former guest on the show. Andy Armstrong is really pissed at me that we did not uh, mention Breaking Bad and the Breaking Bad finale in our episode about uh, television. And all I can do is say, mea culpa, there's a lot of TV out there. You're not wrong. That was an outstanding, outstanding finale of a TV show. And at least for me, I think the, uh, the episode we did pre just recently regarding TV, I seem to focus a lot more on sitcoms. Yeah, uh, We did talk about some, some drama uh, and some dramatic shows like Miami Vice, for example. Uh, but I think somewhere down the line, we may do an episode where we just focus on what do they call the television uh, prestige TV. Hmm. Uh, that's uh, Chris and I have talked about doing an episode where we just talk about kind of those really, really well done dramatic uh, shows. A lot of them have been on cable or, you know, on, um, you know, certainly not on network TV. Breaking Bad is a great example. Sopranos would be an example. Uh, so you're not wrong, Andy. That is a fantastic finale. But just, you know, be patient. We'll get to it. I love to piss Andy off. I think the, uh, <laughs> I've only seen like the first season. So there's, oh, I couldn't well, have recommended it even if I wanted to. I would recommend that you see that as soon as you can. It's it is fantastic, and it's fan. Every season is really really good, and that's not always the case. Even with great you know, dramatic TV, yeah. there, you know. And I'm not saying every single episode was perfect, but boy, every season really was was worth watching. Um, the other thing uh, that I heard back from a listener was uh, uh, from a future guest, uh, Joe Pay, former roommate of ours. Uh, made a point of uh, notifying me that I failed to properly identify Gary Shandling's more recent series, which, you know, I spent a lot of time raving about how critically acclaimed it was and how groundbreaking it was. Uh, but apparently it wasn't so important that I could remember the name correctly. That was called the Larry Sanders show, not Gary Shandling show. And I think I say Gary Shandling show at least three times in, in the episode. I'm not really sure why. Uh, but it was the, the HBO show that I recommended so highly is called Larry Sanders. Show. I still recommend it highly. And I thank you, Joe, for finding that mistake. And this one isn't really a mistake per se, but one of the uh, one of my recommendations, the then recommendation was News Radio. Great ensemble comedy with Dave Foley and Bill Hartman and others. Um, just to make folks aware, we did some research. When I say we, I mean, Tom. And uh, that series streams for free on Pluto TV. You do get ads with that, um, or you can buy it on, on either Apple or Amazon. So I would encourage the free version if you can, but it's one of those that's pretty damn close to being worthy of spending money on. Our next segment is staff recommendations. So this is harkens back to Tom and I going to the record store at least once a week, checking out the board where they'd have staff recommendations, which was mostly new stuff. And that's what Tom and I are really trying to focus on is new releases, whether it be a movie, TV show. A lot of this is going to be music. It does not have to fit the theme of the episode. So let me start off. I've had now two episodes in a row where I am making a staff recommendation involving a female singer. So just yesterday, I got an email uh, from record company that I happen to listen to a lot of their artists. The record company is Blue Elon, E-L-E-L-A-N. Maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong. Maybe there's a cooler French way to say it. Blue Elon. Blue Elon. Uh, but they're home to Corey Brannon, which is probably the, the primary who I listen to, KT Tunsil. Um, interestingly enough, Soul Asylum is now with them. Oh, really? Um, yep. Yeah. And hmm. Jesse Dayton, who's a uh, you know, pretty decent Americana uh, singer, uh, guitar player, and Shiny Ribs, which is one of the breakoffs of the Gourds. But there's others. So check them out on Blue Elan records.com uh but the email i got was to promote a uh, fairly new female singer liz brasher b-r-a-s-h-e-r she has a new album out called baby damn 
this singer is much more sultry, I would argue. The I read a review and the reviewer compares her to Carla Bonoff. It's interesting. He, I guess some other reviewers have called her a little more gothic, which I also I agree that this with this reviewer, he doesn't see the connection. He argues that it's it's a weird review. She doesn't sound like the lead singer from Susie and the Banshees. Um, and she doesn't sound like some other folks, but um, like I said, it's not usually my cup of tea. I listened to the whole album yesterday. The opening track, which I think is a standout, is Room to Ride. Um, it's a love song, really good. There's a pretty cool one. I think it's Empty Spaces, I think what it is. Uh, it's mostly her, there's some heavy guitar in the beginning and a nice playoff with her and the drummer uh, does a really nice job. So. Uh, again, not my cup of tea. I'm never great at describing music, but pimping for a record label that I think has a really nice staple of singers. Um, so I'd encourage folks to give her a listen on the new album, Baby Dam. Maybe uh, somehow we need to tag Blue Elon Records. Maybe we can get some free downloads or something. You know, Let's do that. The popularity of this podcast and the, <laughs> the reach that we have. <laughs> My staff recommendation for this episode is a fairly popular artist. I don't think he needs our help in, in marketing his music. Uh, Nathaniel Rateliff and the Night Sweats came out with an album about two weeks ago called South of Here. I was a big, big fan of their um, um, debut album that came out, oh, geez, probably five or six years ago now. And I fell into what we might call the Derrickson Syndrome, where his second album, I didn't really listen much to primarily because he was just so damn popular and you could tell he was touring, you know, and filling stadiums and what have you. Uh, eventually, I did listen to the second album and thought, you know what, still pretty damn good. He's got an awesome voice. He's got a great delivery. He, he really melds some different types of music together. Uh, he's got a bit of an Americana feel, but he's also very, very soulful. Uh, and um, this album, South of Here, I love. I think it's really good. I've listened to it uh, from beginning to end a couple times since it came out, I want to say last week. And as I said, he doesn't necessarily need my help, but I would recommend it. And uh, I would recommend going back through his back catalog. This might be his fourth album now, now that I think about it. But uh, the new one is probably the best thing I've, I've heard him do uh, from first song to last song since the uh, the debut album that came out a while back. So I'm recommending uh, South of Here by Nathaniel Rateliff and the Night Sweats. All right, let's get, let's take us to our playlist picks. All right. Uh, shall I go first? You shall. So these are two songs. Chris and I will each choose a song to add to our uh, ongoing playlist, which is third song in season three. Uh, we try to fit these as best we can to the theme of our episode. Sometimes we're successful, other times less so. In this case, I believe we both did a very good job. Uh, my playlist pick for this week is Cold Beer Hello by v Royce or The v Royce uh, from the album Just Add Ice, which came out in 1996. Uh, the v Royce is no longer a band, although I think occasionally they still perform together. But uh, the lead of that band was a guy named Scott Miller, who is still out there working, I think, as Scott Miller in the Commonwealth now. Cold Beer Hello was the very first song I ever heard by v Roy's. It's actually a song I heard live before I ever heard a recording of them because they opened up for uh, Alejandro Escovedo when I went to go see him probably 10 years or more ago now. And I fell in love with the band from that, that song forward. And uh, it is a great drinking at the bar song and they are a great band so uh, definitely check out our playlist on spotify and amazon music and apple music and youtube music that's where we keep our playlist and look for cold beer hello by the viewers and i think that's the last song on that album um and it sort of comes out of nowhere because it's a little yeah. different it's just a fun great little it's like they're it's like they're drunk recording a great yeah, song. Yeah, it's a party song for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a party song. So I went with a guy who's probably becoming more popular than I'm used to, but I <laughs> just think this song fits. The artist is Paul Cawthon. One of my favorite songs of his, I'm pretty sure I put it on our one of our playlists, Tom, is Country as Fuck. 
Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Makes fun of some other like bro cowboy, whatever they call the uh you know, the bro country mm-hmm. or whatever. But this one is called simply 25 tequilas. Tom and I were talking about day drinking and I had stories about that. The last verse is we was drinking in the morning because the morning's when you drink if you're gonna dr- if you're planning on drinking all day. And I lost count. <laughs> And I lost count around seven or eight, but all my friends say I must have had about 25 tequilas, 25 tequilas. Judging by the way I'm feeling, I damn sure had a good time. And while he is becoming very popular and some of his songs are a little gimmicky, I mean, this is not a heavyweight song in any way, shape, or form. His voice is fantastic. He yeah, is agreed. Um, I read a review that said he's, he sounds like he's the offspring of Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings. Um, but I think he's called something like the big velvet or something like that. He's got a powerful, deep, smooth voice, and he uses it in songs like this and songs like country as fuck. So yeah, uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's definitely he's funny. He's, oh, like he's funny. funny. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Like he said, I'm not sure he's entering into serious artist territory. I'd be curious to see what he does, especially with that voice. So right, I think that brings us to the end of the episode, my friend. I believe you're right. Uh, this is where we're supposed to tell people to follow us and rate us and give us and your stars and give us your stars. <laughs> when you rate us, give us your stars. That's all we're asking. Although we're also, that's not all we're asking. We're also asking that you write a review. Apparently when you write a review, <laughs> that helps. I also found out in my kind of miscellaneous research that when you download an episode, it's very helpful to us. Huh. Uh, so do that. I mean, would it kill you? So if, and if somebody does download an episode let us know because i want to see what that feels like for us <laughs> yeah i don't I, i'm not sure why but i do know the rating and the reviewing and the following please do all of those things that'd be great we're on spotify which is where we originate we're also on apple podcast amazon music youtube music uh we we have a facebook page which is a good place to communicate with us uh, you can message us through Facebook Messenger. Uh, you can email us at thirdsongin at gmail.com. We would welcome any feedback, whether there are corrections that you give us for post facto or just your opinions on either the theme or uh, suggestions for um, pop culture that we haven't talked about. All right. You can also check us out on our website, thirdsonginpodcast.com. Uh, you can Go directly to episodes. Uh, Tom and I put out a weekly blog every Thursday. His latest is up there about Americana and the band Lucero. I'd strongly encourage you to check that out. You can get a list of all the recommendations we've made with the ratings and otherwise. Um, A lot of stuff. So check that out. There's a way you can contact us. Give us feedback through the website as well. Good, bad, indifferent, whatever. You've been listening to Third Song In. Thanks for listening. I don't want to be around.